Yes, welcome. It's one o'clock, so um, um, now we are going to have a digital wind to cure, uh, to cure it. Um, my name is Henrik Ekman. I'm a journalist here at uh, Jose Andersen Capital. And with me today, I have the management team of uh, Chikurex, which will give an introduction to the company today. Um, as always, uh, uh, the format is that uh, uh, after we have had the presentation from the from the management, there is a, uh, it's possible to uh, ask questions in the chat. Uh, so I will try and do my best to, to forward this to, to uh, the management. Today with us um, from uh, Chikurex is CEO Fernando Andreo and the co-founder and, and CSO Ole Tastrup. A warm welcome to the both of you. Uh, I know you have a lot to talk about uh, this fascinating company with uh, a new way of, of approaching uh, cancer treatment. So, um, so uh, let's hear what, what uh, you have uh, uh, presented for us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Henrik. So, um, First of all, uh, wait, I, the slides are not moving, sorry. Okay, uh, first, the disclaimer about forward-looking statements. I think uh, uh, everybody in the, in the audience is familiar with that. And uh, I would like to start with, it's not working, so, uh, sorry, now it's working, there is a delay. I would like to start with, uh, with a statement uh, about drug sensitivity testing. And I will go in a little bit more detail about what we are talking about but we are a drug sensitivity testing company and we are convinced that drug sensitivity testing will have the same impact in oncology practice as genomics testing did 20 years ago. All of you have heard about genomics, all of you have heard about personalized or precision oncology and how this has changed uh, oncology practice. We think drug sensitivity testing as a complement to genomic testing is going to have to go through the similar transformation in the coming years. So, in a nutshell, what, what is this about? Um, no. So, next slide, thank you. So, what, what we have uh, at Tucurex, we have developed a technology base called IndyTreat, and uh, based on this technology, we have developed a family of diagnostic tests that help predict individual response to drugs in cancer patients. Now, with this, the oncologist is able to select the best treatment uh, uh, for each individual patient. And therefore, the goal is to improve patient outcomes, to improve uh, the, the, uh, the quality of life by avoiding unnecessary side effects, and overall, reducing cost uh, for the healthcare system. Uh, our IndyTreat uh, technology is based on proprietary-based uh, technologies in the fields of both biology and data science. We, we have sophisticated image analysis uh, 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 tools that we have developed. And the, 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 the phase where we are now is we are rolling out uh, through uh, distributor agreements our products in Europe. We have two tests currently uh, available. We have additional tests in the market. We have ISO 13485 certification, we have CE marking, and we are already present in 14 European countries, covering more than 230 million people and approximately 142,000 new colorectal cancer cases every year. Uh, and importantly, the technology can be applied to other cancer entities. So you will see that we have started with colorectal cancer, metastatic colorectal cancer, but we can, we can extend that to other cancer entities. Um, 2021 was a year of fast transformation for Tucurex because we have achieved a number of very important milestones. First, as I said, we launched the two Inditreat tests that we have, Inditreat Start, for first-line patients, metastatic colorectal cancer patients, and Inditreat Extend for third-line metastatic colorectal cancer patients. We published the results of our uh, of our call it like this pivotal clinical trial, the TIC study, that uh, Ole will uh, detail later. We moved our geographic presence from six to 14 countries in Europe. We achieved ISO 13485, and that's important because this shows the maturity uh, of, of our internal operations mainly, and uh, uh, therefore also the scalability. 
we strengthened our uh, commercial team, our commercial operations team. We brought in experienced uh, 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 VP of business development and VP of marketing. Um, we strengthened also the IVD knowledge with CEO, C, new CEO, that's, that's with me, I joined one year ago, and a new CFO who was also coming from the IVD industry. We got the first commercial order in the last days of the year. We built an advisory board with world global leaders in gastrointestinal cancers, and we launched our early access program called Ignite and enrolled the first hospitals in, uh, in this. This is a program to get, uh, to get hospitals to start uh, using it. So let me now go in, in a detail in a couple of these uh, bullet points because I think uh, some of them are, are relevant. One is this commercial strategy. So we are rolling out uh, uh, in Europe throughout distributors. Uh, healthcare systems are very different country to country and you need local knowledge and you need local power, uh, uh, commercial power to, and, and also logistics power uh, to penetrate these this, uh, this healthcare systems. Therefore, we prioritize the countries according to market size, complexity of market access, etc. And then we, we started looking for distributors. Uh, typically, they are IVD companies and they have a complementary portfolio of products. For example, people who are doing genetic profiling, people who are doing immunohistochemistry, and with a strong presence uh, in, in, in hospitals. The distributors are currently now already promoting in the treat start and in the treat extent to the oncology community in their countries. <coughs> and of course, the priority is to enroll hospitals in, in this uh, Ignite program that I was referring to. And uh, it, what is really uh, outstanding is that the reception that we have found in, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the distributor uh, ecosystem to get our product in their portfolio has been very high. And this has allowed uh, uh, this very fast rollout. So if you look at the map now, this is what the map looked back in, uh, I think, July 2021. Uh, so we were present basically in uh, six countries, the four Nordic countries, Portugal and Bulgaria. Then... Uh, in September, we, we got a contract for a distributor, very strong distributor in Spain. Then in October, we added uh, Slovenia. In December, we added Turkey and uh, Latvia and Lithuania. And already in January, we added Poland and Czech and Slovakia in this, in this first two weeks of January. So I think this is, this is, I mean, these distributors would not sign in unless they were convinced that there is a, that there is a market and uh, opportunity there. Um, just to give you an example of how our test uh, helps, um, here is an example with first line treatment. So what you see, uh, what you see uh, in, the, in the red uh, triangles is the, the survival rates of patients who are treated as they are today. So with, uh, with, let's say, a one-size-fits-all chemotherapy approach. So all patients get the same treatment. Either in some hospitals, they start with Folfox and then followed by Folfiri, or in other hospitals, they start with Folfiri, followed by Folfox. What you see in the, in the red triangles is the months of overall survival uh, after, after starting treatment. And what you see in the green dots is how the survival changes when you get the right treatment. This is from a publication, from a recent publication uh, a couple of months ago uh, from a US group. And this is really showing that you can actually double the overall survival. Uh, we are not talking about using different drugs. We are not talking about using new drugs. We are talking about using just the right drug for the right patient. That's what Inditreat does. That what, that's, the, that's the purpose of Inditreat starts. Um, what, what, we, what we see is every year, every year there are 6.8 million new cases of advanced or metastatic colorectal cancer. These are the cancers that are treated with drugs. These are the cancers that are treated with chemotherapy or targeted therapies. Now, approximately a little bit, a little less than 30% of these patients have access to what is called a targeted therapy, where there is a biomarker. But the majority of it, more than 70%, actually follow this one-size-fits-all uh, uh, treatment strategy. 
So here is the first opportunity for Indie Treat is to provide this individual guidance in all those treatments that don't have today uh, uh, a biomarker. And that's the majority of treatments. This is why our vision we have <coughs> summarized as precision oncology for all cancer patients. Um, now I'm going to transfer to Ole, who is going to explain some details about the technology itself. Thank you, Fernando. So what this slide shows uh, that, unfortunately, is a little bit messy, but what it shows is the full process of the industry technology. In the top uh, left corner, you will see the state needle biopsies from liver metastasis. This is a colorectal cancer patient in a metastatic situation. We take a needle biopsy of these dark areas uh, in the liver being the metastasis. From that small sample, we can make copies of the patient's tumors small copies that we have shown together with a number of clinical and academic, and academic partners that it completely resembles the tumor in the patient, both with regard to genetics and with regard to functionality. Then you go down to all these small bottles being drugs. These are the drugs that are being used in the treatment of metastatic colorectal cancer. Inditreat can cover them all. And we are delivering these drugs with a delivery system that we have protected. In the middle down image, you will see in the top uh, hand that these small microtumors, if we are doing nothing to them, they grow over about a week as they would have done in the patient. And then we will simply search for a treatment that be a combination of drugs or a single drug. This is actually a combination of three drugs. And there we did find a treatment that actually was effective in that specific patient. The last uh, image you see is how we present the data. We will not only give the oncologist a um, number to what should we treat your patient with, we will also show how a panel of patients in the same situation, they respond. This is very helpful for hospitals that uh, may want to see how does all my other patients resemble this one, and then they can take a decision. On the next slide, uh, I will try to run a small movie so we could get the movie on. So what you see here is a we have artificial intelligence algorithms that go out, find these small uh, tumoroids, figure out sort of size, compactness, other parameters, this is running extremely fast on our servers here. Very important because these microtumors differ in size. I mean, not only when we say that patients, uh, they respond individually, these tumoroids also like small individuals. Fernando mentioned to you that we released here this year, actually this summer, the result of our TIC trial. This was the first prospective interventional trial with a microtumor test like Intertreat that actually guided the treatment. Here, we were able to surpass the endpoint. The endpoint that was defined by the hospital was that we should improve the progression-free survival, the time at which the patients will not experience a progression of the disease. We should improve that 100%. And that means from 20 to 40%, we actually improved it to 50%. And this was uh, presented at the ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology meeting, the biggest cancer meetings uh, in the world. This is just to give you a little bit of history. Now, this is the first time that we introduced Curix uh, to the H.C. Anderson environment. Uh, the company was actually spun out of Karlsberg. In 2006, the Karlsberg Research Center that is doing a lot else than beer. Uh, there the base technology was invented. We then shortly thereafter moved to the biggest surgery site for colorectal cancer in Copenhagen, the University Hospital Bispebjerg. We lived there for 10 years. This has been extremely important for Tukuric because then we fully understand how the environment in the hospital works and we ensured that our technology will fit straight in to the workflow in the hospital. Today, we have moved to the research park, Symbion. Now, I don't need to go through uh, all the sort of um, our, uh, I would say our key points. Uh, a lot of them has been 
covered by Fernando. The only thing I will mention here is that we have ethical approval <coughs> for a biobank where we can store live tumoroids. And that allows us to go back and retest patients and also compare some of our biobank patients with new patients. And with that, I'll give it back to Fernando. Yes, <clears throat> and uh, just a little bit uh, wrapping up the presentation, I wanted to share with you what are our, what are our goals in 2022. Uh, mainly, we, we have these three goals. So we want to be present with our Inditreat test in 20 countries. I mentioned before, we are already at 14. So 20 should be, should be feasible in, in Europe. Um, we are targeting to get at least, at least 30 hospitals using Inditreat. Uh, this might not seem a lot, but keep in mind that to get a new technology into a hospital, there are a lot of practical uh, uh, practical hurdles and issues that have to be overcome, both administrative, economic, logistic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's not just a matter of convincing the oncologist; it's a matter of getting the product into the into, into the system. And uh, we mentioned we have two products already in our portfolio: two tests, in the treat to start and in the treat extend. We want to have at least one more product uh, out there, also in the field of metastatic colorectal cancer. So that would be uh, uh, our, our metrics for, for 2022. And beyond 2022, uh, what are our, call it like this, vectors of growth, if you know, if you want, in the long term? So the first thing is geographic expansion. So all our current plan, 22, is based on Europe only. Now, obviously, there is a huge market in the US, Middle East, Asia. So uh, uh, we... we we are not planning to go there in 22, but this is certainly the geographic is one vector of growth. The other vector of growth, obviously, is beyond metastatic colorectal cancer. So we are planning to, we, we, we have already projects in pancreatic, for example. So we are planning first to cover most gastrointestinal cancers because there is a, call it like this, commercial synergy when you stay within the field of gastrointestinal, you are addressing the same uh, oncologist. But then we, 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 we can expand and we will expand to gynecological cancers. We have also projects in ovarian, for example, and then other cancer entities. And finally, the third vector of growth is today, we are, we are running this, uh, all this, what we have described, we are running this as a service. So we have a central lab in, uh, here in Copenhagen where we receive the samples, we test the samples, and we deliver back the results to the oncologist. Now, there is another model that can be developed, uh, and this is that we build or we, we design and build an instrument that can be placed in the hospitals and therefore switching or, let's say, expanding our business model from service to uh, selling a system, an instrument, software, reagents, et cetera, et cetera. So these are three vectors of growth that we, uh, if, when we consolidate in 2022 our current, uh, current short-term goals, then uh, uh, this, is, this is where we are going to, to, to be moving. So in summary, in summary uh, I think you, you, you have seen there is an urgent need to improve the way how drugs are used today. 70% of treatments are one-size-fits-all. Um, drug sensitivity testing is emerging as the tool that will bring precision, precision oncology uh, to the next level. And to Curex is, from all companies out there, best positioned to lead the space. We have a proven and mature technology, IP protected in major countries. We have a team with a lot of experience. We have two tests already in the market. We have a pipeline of development. We have a solid rollout plan through the partnerships in Europe. And we have processes and structure in place that, that allow us to scale up the operations. <coughs> and importantly also, our financial position is quite strong. I mean, if you, if you look at the, the published uh, data, you will see that uh, our cash in hand allows us for uh, a, a, a peaceful rollout of our, of our expansion plans. So with that, I think I will uh, uh, turn back to Henrik for the Q&A. Thank you very much, Fernando. Very interesting. Um, yes, perhaps uh, all the, I can start out with, with, with you. Um, if we, we uh, start on sort of a higher note in, in, in terms of uh, what, how would you describe the risk reward profile 
for for Chikurex compared to to uh, as 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 you're not making new drugs, but you're 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 uh, using uh, established drugs already. What is what is the risk reward compared to a normal biotech company? Okay, I mean, it's obvious that. Uh, as we are using all the drugs that are out there, and I think it's very important to stress that there are fantastic drugs in the marketplace, drugs that save people every day. The biggest challenge we have is to match it with the right patient. So you can say with regard to risk and, and reward, uh, we have no risk with regard to the actual drugs. The risk is on the technology and the rollout and penetration into the market. We have prov proven that the technology works. We have it a solid IP protection. And I think it was very clear from what Fernando showed you that actually the rollout and our ability to get into the market actually, I would say, even surprised us positively how fast that has been possible. So I'm absolutely convinced that the risk profile for us is different. Uh, the risk, especially now when we already have products in the market, is much smaller. Uh, and uh, I would say uh, we certainly have a, um, a very interesting reward. You could argue if you are a drug discovery company, you have one drug that will go out and become a wonder drug. Uh, yes, then you will have a very, very steep uh, reward uh, uh, sort of curve that will look different from us, but it's a more secure investment, especially now. Okay, um, Fernando, perhaps I can turn turn to you. Uh, you joined the company uh, a little less than a, than a year ago, and uh, are responsible for uh, making this transition from being a, a developing com company to a, a fully commercialized uh, uh, company. What, what have you uh, done to, to, to make that possible? Because for many companies, that's a, quite a huge uh, transition and, and often a very challenging one. So what have you done to, to, to make sure that you are able to, to, um, to go to this um, commercial route? Well, I think uh, maybe a couple of things. The first one is the way we have defined our, our, testing, our testing portfolio uh, now is very much matching the specific customer needs. So we have looked at when the oncologist has to make a decision of, of, uh, uh, between certain drugs. And there are multiple points in the life of the patient where the oncologist has to make a decision. There is neoadjuvant setting, there is adjuvant setting, then there is metastatic disease, first line, second line, third line, and additional line. So in all of these situations, actually the challenge that the oncologist is facing is different. And what we have done and what we are doing is we are developing specific products that are tailored to that, to each of that, uh, those specific situations. So as opposed to trying to commercialize a, generic, a technology that can do everything, we have very much focused in specific products or let's say services in this case, tests that the oncologist can relate to, can recognize and actually that fit in the scheme of how oncology is practiced. That, that was, I think, one important thing that we have uh, done during the year. And then obviously the second one was to strengthen the commercial, the commercial arm. So uh, the company was very well staffed uh, in research, in the testing facility, et cetera, et cetera. But obviously it was, was short in the, in the business development, marketing and commercial. So we brought in two people, uh, Jesper Christiansen and uh, Pia van der Zee. And they are both very experienced. They are type of people who can hit the ground running because they know exactly what needs to be done. They have done it before. And then, of course, we, we redefine a more aggressive approach to our commercial uh, geographic rollout, as you have seen in the, in, the, in the map. So I would highlight these two things. Then there are a lot of things related to internal processes, et cetera, et cetera, but uh, that would be too long to, to explain. Mm. Okay, Ole. Perhaps uh, this is a question for you regarding the sort of the the, the technical scientific challenges of of, of moving from uh, colorectal cancer treatment uh, tests to other uh, cancer forms. How how diff how easy or difficult is it uh, to move from from this? Is is it is it replica uh, in in all cancer forms, or, or what sort of the challenging and and how fast can you move? 
uh, sort of uh, from from one from from one test uh, of of uh, a certain cancer form to the next one. Is it months, years, or how should we look at this? Uh, it's definitely not years, and I would say that that the uh, the industry technology is applicable to most solid cancers. We have stayed in solid cancers. Can't go beyond, but we have, we are in solid cancers. Um, one thing is the technology development. Another aspect that has been very important for us to right up front find the right clinical partner. That was what happened in colorectal cancer, because immediately we found, uh, in this case, University Hospital Bispebjerg and UKE in Hamburg that have a lot of knowledge in colorectal cancer. So I would say there's the technical bit, but that we are not that concerned of. There we have a lot of experience and have actually already moved into a number of other entities. But we need to get a solid clinical partnership to people that really treat these patients on a daily basis. And, and, and there we have several, we also have a very strong relationship to, to uh, Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham, UK, where we get that knowledge in. So we build in the knowledge from the oncologist into the technology up front. And, and, and a follow-up question to, to that, the, your, your, as, as you cooperate with oncologists, uh, because I, I think there is a, a, a sort of a, a uh, there has been at least uh, previously uh, this this idea that that uh, there's a lot of conservatism in in treating uh, cancers in, in in the different hospitals. So 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 what what are you meeting of of challenges trying to persuade these uh, experienced oncologists to to use this rather uh, different system in in treating instead of what they what they have done for for decades. Yes, Henrik, there is conservatism, and there probably should be. I mean, we don't want patients treated with the one or the other. It needs to be a solid basis when you start treatment of cancer patients. But the conservatism is there. I would say we have been helped tre tremendously by the genetic profiling. As Fernando mentioned, uh, over the last 20 years, uh, genetics have been moved into uh, the individual hospital departments. They are now used to actually stratifying patients using a genetic tool. That helps a lot because now they can see that genetics can help them in the best case, maybe in 25% of the cases. What about the rest? So they have already that mindset that there we need tools. So I have certainly seen it to be a lot easier now than it was 10 years ago. So mm. things are moving uh, in this direction. Good to hear. Uh, Fernando, there is a question from the chat regarding uh, this cooperation with the hospitals in the IGNITE program. Um, you, you're mentioning that there is a, a, a list of hospitals, but you only announced one. So how, how many are active today, actually? Yeah, actually, <laughs> we, we have had a lot of uh, internal debate about uh, about what, what we disclose and how much we disclose, because, I mean, we have to balance two things. This is a competitive environment. So there are, there are uh, several companies that are trying to establish their, their position in this emerging field of functional testing and drug sensitivity testing. So we, uh, on the one side, we, we don't want to give too much information. On the other side, obviously, there is the transparency to the financial markets and to our shareholders. So what we agreed internally is that we are not going to issue a press release every time we sign a new contract with a new hospital, but rather what we are going to do is in each of the quarterly reports, we are going to uh, have, let's say, a fixed section where we are going to inform about the evolution of the number of hospitals that we enroll, so that at least there will be a sense of how we are progressing. Uh, perhaps you could also just briefly touch upon the, the, the sort of the structure, the, the typical structure of these uh, um, uh, partner agreements with different distributors. What, what, how are they incentivized? How do you share the, the, uh, the, uh, the revenue when, when it starts uh, coming in, 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 in the year? What, what, what's it, the structure? It is a typical distribution agreement in the sense that, uh, I mean, the, the distributors are signing the contracts with the hospitals. The distributors are selling to the hospitals and they are invoicing and taking care of all the process of uh, invoicing, collection, or getting the order, then invoicing, collection, etc., etc. And then the distributor is buying the service from us. So 
uh, we are charging the distributor a certain price, and then the distributor is charging at a markup to the, to the end hospital. And that margin of the distributor has to allow them with, uh, uh, to cover all the commercial costs, uh, local promotion, uh, local logistics, and, uh, uh, and, and, and all these things. Uh, this is, but of course, this is this cost is uh, this cost of all this infrastructure is diluted because these distributors have a broad portfolio of other products. So our product is just coming on top, and uh, and we and then of course in the price that we charge to them, we are keeping the whole profit that we or the whole margin that we need to cover R and D production uh, and our local uh, or so let, let's say our global sorry. Uh, uh, promotional activities like being at ASCO or being at ESMO or uh, these kind of things. So, but it's a typical distribution agreement in the sense that we charge the distributor and then the distributor charges the hospital at the markup. Mm. Speaking of, of, of these uh, potential revenues uh, coming, um, how do you how do you try and value or, or see the addressable market? You have you have these numbers of how many new cases of of, of patients. And I, I guess there are also I, I don't know what the average price is for the test in different markets. If, it, if so, so can you can you touch upon the the sort of uh, addressable market size and, and how you uh, how this will, uh, the test industry uh, test will be priced in the market? Yeah. So um, let's say let's start with the number of cases in Europe. In Europe, there are approximately two hundred and fifty thousand. Uh, uh, new cases every year of metastatic colorectal cancer. Okay, and now these patients are are diagnosed with metastatic colorectal cancer in different stages. Some of them are already stage four. Some of them are stage three. Some of them are stage two. Each of these stages has a different treatment option. And and then uh, what, uh, as I explained before, we are tailoring our products to the, to the, to these different uh, uh, places. So what what we have is a model where we know out of these 250,000 cases, how many are diagnosed in stage one, in stage two, in stage three, in stage four, how many go in first line, in second line, in third line. So it's relatively easy for us to calculate the number of cases that we have as a total addressable market for uh, each of our tests. And then of course, we have some assumptions about market penetration, how long it's going to take. We have a projection over the next three years about how, how what, what is our penetration uh, uh, in, in each of the countries that we are going to, to be addressing, etc. Uh, regarding the price, I think we have disclosed it already. Uh, the price is around 3,000 euro per test. And this is a price that when you compare with, uh, with for example, the prices of next generation sequencing or, or other, other technologies that are already uh, more or less standard routine in the, in, in the market, it's a price that is comparable. So when you were asking before about the what, what are the hurdles for adoption, etc. I have to say that so far price is not among these hurdles. We think we have hit a good a good spot here. Okay, there are a couple of questions uh, from the chat regarding the lead time from when you make a contract with a hospital uh, until it's actually um, uh, being treated according to to your test results and 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 how how when you are uh, when you are invoiced. Um, uh, as, as you move, as you use the tests, can you can you say about the, the lead time of, of all these contracts being made currently? Well, um, I don't know if you're referring to the Ignite program, which is yes, this yeah, uh, early yeah. access program. I mean, it's it's very difficult, but we estimate that uh, from from the moment a hospital starts using the test to the moment we can convert them into buying the test. It, I mean, it's variable, but we are estimating around three months. Around three months, okay. I can see time is running here, so just a, a short uh, question to, to finish up here. It's been very interesting to, to hear these things, and, and you mentioned, uh, the, um, Fernando, you mentioned the, uh, the strong cash position of the company, um, uh, but currently you're not, you're not having any revenue or profits. So, so how should we uh, look at the, the sort of the bridge to profits going forward uh, in, 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 in terms of, 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 of when uh, you either have profits or you need to have extra funding? What, 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 how should we think about that? Uh, okay, let me, let me um, answer to this by saying that we have a three-year projection that is our base plan. And in this three-year projection, we are reaching cash flow positive uh, 
without the need to going through any other funding round. Okay. And that's and that's our our base uh, model, so to say. Of course, you can always think you want to do additional projects, you want to be more aggressive here and there. But right now, we are working with uh, with uh, a plan that doesn't contemplate any uh, any additional uh, funding round. Okay. Okay. And but I guess that, that as would we, lead us, and that would lead us to cash uh, cash flow neutral. Yeah, I guess as as you move as we're moving into uh, as we're moving um, into this year and you start getting revenues, uh, I guess that we could expect uh, perhaps this year a more detailed financial guidance in, uh, from from you as a company. Yes, uh, <laughs> there has also been some internal discussion about when when is the right moment. I think it's uh, the the most sensible thing to do is to wait until we see uh, the a, a consistent revenue flow so to say and then we can make uh, we can make logical projections about what would happen so yes uh, through, throughout the year as uh, as soon as we start as i say having a stable flow of revenue we will we will issue a, a guidance okay thank you we're running a little uh, over time so uh, uh, um, fernando andreo and and uh, Ole Tastel, thank you very much for making this introduction uh, um, presentation of Chukurex and we would be excited to follow you and, and have more events with you going forward. Thank you very much and thank you to the audience for listening in. Thank you. Thanks, Henrik, for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.